What are we having today? Oh, yes. All right. Well, thank you for coming to our uh, monthly tech cafeteria. We've got some cool stuff lined up for you uh, this afternoon besides the awesome food. Uh, we have Giacomo Ciminello here to speak with us today. Um, he's got some really cool things to talk to us about, about how to improve our community through play. Um, and something that has to do with spaced invaders. So I'm going to give it over to Giacomo. Right on. Welcome, everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So whenever I get my little soapbox, so let me introduce myself first. Giacomo Ciminello. Awesome pronunciation. Usually it's guacamole salmonella, but we'll go with that. Um, I used to be a sort of, I grew up in the flash development world and listened to a lot of house music. So, you know, obviously I'm into things that stick around. And I went through, became an art director and was kind of in, in that world for a while, was in advertising for a lot. And then I ended up <clears throat> here in Cincinnati where now I bartend and have fun doing that. So basically I like to screw around a lot. And one of the places I like to hang out is sort of in children's museums and playful environments. And I'm going to talk a little bit about play before we get into sort of the, the Space Invader thing, just so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I love interactive experiences. I love creating a human experience and, and the entire thing that goes along with that, uh, sort of the holistic design process involved there. So why play? Why, why is that important? Well, as soon as we come out of the womb, we're playing. Uh, we actually, our brain processes like almost 10 or 15 times faster when we're younger than when we get older. That's sort of something that happens. Uh, it's great for cognitive development, social development, physical development. It's how we make friends. It's how we problem solve. It's how we um, basically come into the world. I mean, if you think about it, we, don't, we can't even communicate when we come out. There's just a whole bunch of things happening. And we, in a matter of weeks, days, and months, and all that stuff, we can actually start to get our thoughts and everything coming, coming out into the world. So play is super important for children, but obviously it makes us happy. It literally creates endorphins that goes to the parts of our brain that makes us smile, makes us feel good. Um, and the way we learn, the way we're developed are changing. We're not so focused anymore. There's a whole bunch of different learning methodologies to help us grow and develop. Uh, Montessori, Montessori method is kind of a big thing. If anyone's grown up, grown up in that Montessori program, it teaches more collaborative uh, methods of learning. And the spaces themselves, the environments around it are kind of feeding into that. And if you look at sort of this as a regular classroom space, you can see this transitioning into the workspace nowadays. Um, some of the most, we can call them innovative, you can argue whether they're innovative or not, companies in the world actually share some of the things we've been doing since uh, kindergarten in the, way that we, in the way we kind of come together and share and experience a space um, and create positive energies. Uh, these are some of my more favorite office spaces in the world. This one's an awesome space. I like you guys. So much light. But <clears throat> um, I always used to joke around that one of the better agencies you could possibly create is just a daycare, and you just you know kind of put a little branding mark on the outside and say we are an actual little ad agency, and you could solve some of the best problems in the world. And if anyone sees commercials, they, you know, children often give the best responses when you give them a problem. It's because they kind of throw out logic. And they're supporters of this. I mean, Einstein himself said that play is the highest form of research. Um, it's because you're out of that logic box. Logic doesn't make sense when you're playing. Like, if you think of freeze tag, freeze tag makes no sense. But you were able to make those rules as a child, right? OK, I'm going to run around, and I'm going to tag you, and you're just going to stop moving. OK, can I move now? No, someone else has to untag you. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, OK, I'll just stand here and wait for it. But we did this all the time. We did a lot of just kind of improv, improvisational games. And we make up the rules as we go along. So in all seriousness, we need to seriously start thinking more and uh, start playing more and thinking less, seriously. So whenever you do, um, however you're problem solving in your daily work life, try not to take it so seriously. All right, so we have a phrase that we really hate in our group. Uh, I work hard and I play harder. Uh, that kind of connotes that work and play are different, that they're opposites. Um, when in fact they're actually not. Let's think about this for a second. Uh, work versus play. So when you're growing up, you go outside and you play. Uh, eventually, that sort of transitions to I have to do homework, or I have to do classwork, or I have to go to work work. Um, but if you think about it, we're, all we're doing is we're just substituting a word there. You should really love what you're doing at any given time. That's what makes us happy, that's what makes us innovative, that's what drives us. Um, work connotes stress, anxiety, and it's actually been tested that when they fire, the, when someone says the word work, your blood pressure kind of shoots up. Um, you should 
start to kind of think of them as the same thing. So if work and play are the same thing, and play makes us happy, then here's something that should kind of drive you going forward. The, the opposite of play is not work, it's depression. Um, this is something that affects a lot of creatives, uh, especially um, sometimes when your work can't come out, when you can't solve a problem, when you have an idea that you can't bring to fruition, it kind of brings you down. Uh, it works in the opposite way. So a great solution is just to go out and kind of move your body around, get the blood flowing, exercise a little bit, and get playing. Uh, this whole theory started back in Philly when I was working with this girl right here in grad school. Um, she was from the Midwest, had never been to the East Coast City. I don't know if anyone's been here to New York or Philly. Um, it's where I grew up. Uh, you can say whatever you want. I'm totally going to agree with you. Um, but uh, Philadelphia, is a, it's, a, it's a very different town than Cincinnati in, in many ways, and it starts with the people. Um, she came up to me one day and was like, I don't understand, like, how do people in cities like this have, have memories, like happy memories? I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean, happy memories? She's like, well, I grew up, you know, in Kansas, and she, you know, grew up right outside Kansas City, I believe, and in Missouri and Glasgow and all these other little cities. And she's like, I used to play, and granted, she was an industrial designer, and she designed swings, and, and there were collaborative swings that required two or three people. And she's like, and this is, these are the memories I have of, like, swinging and running and, and, like, playing in lakes and ponds and streams and all that. And I'm like, okay, well, you can still do that here. And then she's like, no, look at the city. Look at how mapped out it is. It's a machine. It's designed to be efficient. Like, there's no way you could, like, be happy here. And I'm like, okay, well, um, I can kind of see your point. And then she sort of took the city map and overlaid it onto a lot of the designs of offices. And we're like, look, it's all designed based around routines and how to be efficient and how to be productive with your time. And you know, we dove into a little bit more, because this became a thesis eventually, and came across this, that routines maximize producti productivity precisely by reducing human creativity. And this was fairly true in a lot of the scenarios we were looking at. So I was like, all right. Let's push this further. Let's look at the blighted spaces in Philadelphia. Um, blighted spaces in Philly are a little different than here. I could admit, this is, Philly was the furthest west I'd ever been in my life. Um, and the spaces there are areas about the size of Fountain Square um, that are just badly designed, and they go unused. And for an, a city like Philadelphia, which is super dense in population, it was really depressing. I mean, there was a lot of gray and monotone going on. And remember, the environment around us is what affects us. If you think about those spaces we looked at before, the office spaces, and how much more energy they can produce. Um, you know, we had something here. And then we stumbled across this one thing one day where we're like, OK, well, the city is clearly giving us a canvas here. It's giving us something to do, because people can do things in these spaces that would make it better. Uh, we came across bike polo, which was happening underneath uh, I-95 in a kind of fenced-in hockey rink. And this was what people were doing. They were, they were using what the environment was giving them, and they were creating a game out of it. I mean, there's no horses. Uh, you can't use, well, the horses were not allowed in city limits anymore. So how do you play polo? Well, there's a lot of bicyclists. They're very rugged. They like to kind of get brutal with it. You kind of have to nowadays on the roads, especially in Cincinnati. Um, and they would just go around and they'd play this game and, and we realized it was a whole league and we followed around for a while and like, wow, this is great. They're making up a game. They're making up the rules as they go along and they're creating this awesome experience for themselves within an urban environment. So the theory then became, well, if we introduce playful events like this, playful games, playful things within these spaces, can we actually affect change? Uh, and then we looked for a case study about this and, well, there was one. Uh, at, basically, after the Great War and Europe was all bombed and decimated, uh, one city in particular tried to bounce back really hard. Um, I mean, it was literally shell-shocked. Uh, devastation not seen um, basically on this turf ever. Uh, but basically, one architect, his name was Aldo Van Eyck, decided to, well, the cheapest and fastest way to do this and to get everybody out of the homes is to take these lots, take these bombed out spaces, and turn them into playgrounds. And they did it in almost every lot that they could find. Uh, and soon the communities came out of their homes and within, you know, years, decades, etc., it became one of the most playful cities on the planet, one of the most uh, best to live in, best to work in, um, always top five in, in kind of those areas. This is uh, an example from one of their exhibits called Urban Play where they actually do, they create moments of interaction within the city. Um, to have the citizens come out and make it their own. It's all, it's all street art, and you could argue that, but it's all interactive street art in a sense. Uh, this is one of my favorites from Steven Sagmeister. He did this where it's you know, a beautiful design, and actually as you zoom in, it's made of euros that were sorted by their um, 
I guess, age, so the tarnish on them, made of different colors. And then volunteers spent about a week and a half putting it all together. And then the moment that it was opened up to the world, the cops came and swept it up to preserve the art. It was a, it's a nice little fun little experiment, um, social experiment in that regard. Uh, but this city uh, is Amsterdam. And to this day, again, still one of the happiest places on the planet for various reasons. We can argue that later. But um, I gave a similar presentation to Artworks a year and a half ago, and I'm so happy to say I can now segue to this slide, which is pretty cool. Uh, but it's always these little moments that you interject into an urban culture that create uh, moments of play for people. So you can go up and experience this site and this city in different ways. So play as a tool for urban revitalization. What do we need? Uh, well, what are the benefits, basically? Uh, it initiates a dialogue between the public and the city. It can enrich public spaces. It can strengthen civic morale, and it can improve well-being. Uh, just so you know, this is also, so this is an, the, the photo behind here is another example of making something that the city can give you. So this is from Rio, where they banned outdoor advertising, uh, which unfortunately made Rio very ugly, because there were tons of billboard skeletons all over the city. And an architect went along and said, oh, let's just put swings in some of them. So you're actually on top of a skyscraper swinging on swings. Fairly suicidal, but kind of cool at the same time. So what do we need? We need tools. Uh, lots and lots of tools. Um, this is interaction design 101, right? So tools engage your user. Um, when we founded our group, Play Cincy, uh, we have some core values. Our core values are construction. Construction is a huge part of development. Um, uh, childhood development all the way up to adult development. So if you're a product designer uh, of any sort, you probably have Legos or Play-Doh at the ready. It's all about rapid prototyping, right? Uh, storytelling and role playing. The ability of a child or as children to role play and improv uh, is unparalleled. Can I add, has anybody in this room ever done improv before? Awesome, cool, keep doing it. It's probably the, a, a great way to like warm up the brain. It's like, really hard, it's really stressful, but once you get kind of warmed up and doing it, it's one of the most powerful brainstorming tools uh, I think I've ever found. I'm terrible at brainstorming, I always, especially if I'm in a room with like one copywriter, I'm just like staring at him like, for about 30 minutes, and then it's like, you want to go get a beer, and we can just talk about this? Like, there's faster ways to brainstorm, and storytelling and role-playing is definitely one of, the, one of the methods to get there. Uh, cooperation is huge. Um, when we talk about play, competitive play is fine, um, but it has a different effect on the brain. See Bengals versus Steelers. Like, competitive play can go bad really quickly, so we like to do cooperative play, where no one's really against each other. You're more along the lines of forcing yourself to do better. And then strategy. So strategy is more of an adult concept than a childhood one. Um, but it's important that we keep honing that strategic part of our brain so that we're always trying to, again, be more efficient and be more creative. But we have a means to an end in that regard. So those are sort of the basic values behind Placency. And we're just, again, a group of people that get together once in a while. And we have great ideas. We want to bring to light issues in the city and do them in a very fun, fun way. And some of those ways are, well, here's our mission, again, is to activate the often overlooked or unused urban spaces with a random act of play. So what are those random acts? Uh, some of our, they've always been very analog. Um, something like a large crayon. These crayons are actually designed for adults. It's very hard for children to use them. They're about 25 pounds. Um, <laughs> and children often just scribble and stuff. So whenever you see something actually that makes sense, it's probably an adult that did it, which is you know the point of it. Um, we built a really big light bright and because we started to play with uh, light. Most of our things were happening during the day. We wanted to experiment with light. And this is actually probably one of the more technological things we were getting into. And again, it's just lights and the ability to turn them off and on and stuff like that. But this was uh, our, our step towards darkness and light. Um, and then sometimes we build large goats to pay homage to Katie Home or Katy Perry's halftime show. Um, which is fine, you know. It's, again, it's all part of role playing. Um, but we knew our next one, we were going to be, we wanted to go a lot bigger. Uh, again, growing up in, in Philly and New York, blight is very different than Cincinnati. When I first walked the streets of Cincinnati, and entire neighborhoods were vacant and boarded up and stuff like that, um, it affected me emotionally. I was actually scared for the first time in my life. And this is, I grew up in Philadelphia. Our kill rate was something like 2.5 people a day, and that was with. 1.5 hidden by police reports that they didn't want to report. So I never felt fear in my life until I actually walked the streets of Cincinnati for the first time. It was very odd and disconcerting. But we knew that if we're going to like bring the people to these neighborhoods, it had to be a lot bigger. Um, it had to basically 
shine a spotlight on the depression as opposed to kind of you know be something that's placed there and let people kind of discover it. So uh, I'm going to show this real quick in case anyone has uh, don't show that again has never seen uh, a fight the blight event or a space invader event. You. So that's our cheesy introduction to Fight the Blight, um, which is a campaign that we started to, again, attack these larger scale abandoned neighborhood issues. Um, and how it works, I'll bring up kind of Tyler, my partner in crime over here, to talk a little bit about basically the entire, the entire system. Um, but we'll start here with Mia. So Mia is our, oops, here we go, is this thing on? No, oh, there's a button here somewhere. Oh, there it is. There you go. Yep. Yeah, nice. So go ahead and explain Mia. Uh, well, I didn't have a lot to do with the box itself. I believe you said it was a... You're not helping my lecture. <laughs> is it a, a <laughs> reclaimed uh, it arcade is. machine that you refurbished? It is. It's uh, something we bought off Craigslist. The guy was so happy to give it to us and lend it to the cause. Right. Um, but it houses all of our components, right? Yep. So. Right. All right. So uh, uh, I'm Tyler. I was the software developer, and uh, I also help mod certain parts of the hardware, you know, the camera in particular. So the way the whole thing ends up working, uh, we wanted to design something to allow people to run back and forth a lot, since we have this big open, uh, empty lot to run through, and most of, like most of what. Uh, is actually fun, in my opinion, is the people watching. Like, it's more designed for the people watching the person make a little bit of a fool of themselves as they run back and forth playing this really old video game I, that uh, we ported, basically, or I guess remade. Yeah, remade. Uh, some of the technology I used was uh, Unity 3D. Uh, I used a, uh, a library, open source library, called AForge to 
essentially use a camera and an infrared light that is attached to the back of this. The infrared light shines outward towards uh, this vest and uh, the camera will actually see nothing but the vest because it's so overwhelmingly bright. Uh, if you shine, like if you, if you took a, a picture of him right now with the flash camera, your camera would see nothing but like a big bright uh, white like, vest. Like a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> so the camera sees this like just big white dot and from there I can tell uh, Unity 3D, the game engine, to just using AForge to track this white dot on a bitmap image and uh, the program will then take the coordinates of that bitmap image like where the white dot is and translate it into the game directly which is in the trailer you saw some of the person running back and forth and um, uh, the reason for the vest was to make it so that they could literally be like any orientation there's like no no problem you may have even noticed a guy on one of those uh, hoverboard segway things playing uh, we also had a guy, uh, I don't know if any video of him, but there was a, a guy in a wheelchair who had all this stuff on and somebody was pushing him around and, and stuff like that. So literally anybody that can move around and wear this thing can play it. Yeah, it was really fun to watch the, the different experiences. There were, like, this, the crowd, especially, as you mentioned before, was really fun. Um, people were like, biting at the bit to get there and play, but they were strategizing at the same time. So they would actually watch other people go first and be like, all right, he's strafing. I don't like that. <laughs> I'm going to wait. Wait, I think I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do. I got it. I got it. And then they go up, and then they would fail miserably. Um, but no, they have the guy that come up with the hoverboard, and then the, the gentleman in the wheelchair where his friend was pushing him. Like, these are, again, people are taking what's there, taking what the environment is giving them, and modding it for their own. And it was, it was really awesome to watch. Uh, but yeah, the jumpsuits, uh, retro-reflective vests. This is a Mega Man cannon that we modded with Bluetooth. So it came with the sounds. Um, we just made it so that the computer can hear it. Yeah charge up and everything. Yeah, basically the, uh, the gun sends the like, space bar to the uh, computer and uh, my program just happens to fire a bullet when the space bar is pressed. Like so. space bars. Yep. <laughs> and then uh, protective headgear because obviously, I mean, come on, you look, you look cool. Uh, but you are running around at night, so one of our things was safety factor and you know, we're going into abandoned lots, so kind of protecting a little bit made sense. Uh, but yeah, and this is the gist of it. Uh, there's obviously more components involved, like powering a $35,000 projector. Um, but the player exists between the Mia and the playing surface, and they run back and forth. Uh, again, rebuilt in Unity from the ground up. Uh, we were able to source almost everything was free library as far as the yeah, player design. Space Invaders is such a simple game. It really wasn't that much time to get it working again. Mm -hmm. Way to be modest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That was the easy part. Yeah. Uh, the second easy part was finding spaces to do this in. I mean, if you just walk around downtown, uh, we were finding tons of canvases ripe for uh, using this. Uh, lots of parking lots, lots of empty lots, lots of walls. Um, again, People's Liberty made this possible because it's a large projector. Uh, this is not something you're going to hang in your house or your office. It could heat up my 1,100 square foot home um, if I turned it on. It's, um, we, we got lucky, basically. It was a guy in, um, was it, San Diego was selling six of them. So he was selling the lens, which is a $2,000 lens, $2,000 bulb, and the entire housing for only $6,000. So they get typically around 35000 So if anybody has a need for a 40-foot projection screen, you let me know. Um, <laughs> I can lend it to you. So is it one projector, or are you edge blending it? It's just one. Yeah, it's just one guy. Um, it, it's about 180 pounds, so any more projectors <laughs> would uh, be a little rough. It does work better on, obviously, light surfaces. So, you know, you talk about adding multiple projectors, you're really just in increasing the intensity and the saturation and, yeah, making it bigger at a certain point. So will it w we tested it on Union Terminal. It wouldn't work for various reasons because they had lights flooding it and there was too many windows and things like that nature. Uh, we do have uh, ideas to test it at other places this summer. Um, but we did get to kind of prototype at a little more than six. Some nights we'd you know, be like, hey, let's just fire it up. And we did like unevent, un unofficial events. Um, the high score still stands from, that's like our first yeah. site, right? No, the second one. The second one, second one, yeah. Well, the first official, I guess. Yeah, yeah that guy yeah. got all the way up to wave five. Um, we have had more than probably 100 players, but pretty close to 100. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, I guess. Uh, so what's in store for the future? So the system tracks one person at a time right now. 
one player going back and forth. I know a big goal for myself is to get collaborative play going, so two, two people at one time. Um, yeah, I, just different games, like, uh, in, in my opinion, like, something I want to do is continue to use Unity. That's the tool that I really like. But uh, I'd like to open it up to, like, the Cincinnati community to be able to also add games to it. Because essentially, when we get down to it, it's just uh, the, the way it is right now. Uh, it's just the left and right and a space bar. And that's the, that's the controls for the game. So I want to make it as easy as possible for people to, if they're interested in making a game, to be able to make their own, you know, just using the arrow keys and the space bar and then producing as much art as they want to and then from there helping them be able to port it onto the, uh, the, the box that runs with the camera and everything. It's essentially yeah. the same thing. And a big thing that I want to also interject is, um, so it doesn't technically, it, technically it's not video mapping right now, so anyone's familiar with video mapping, like you're supposed to map it to a surface, tell it where windows and doors are and things like that. Um, if you think about Pac-Man, think about the side of a building, it'd be awesome if a level auto-generated based on where we park it and all of a sudden Pac-Man pellets fill up in between all the, all the windows and stuff like that and all the sprites so automatically know where to go. Um, that's something we're, we're working on inter inter interjecting into it. Um, and then of course, well, we can give a hint on what my favorite game would be next. Okay. All right. Um, so if you're ready for player one, how about are you ready for player two? Um, so one of my favorite, favorite roles uh, growing up, obviously, is Ghostbusters. This summer, Ghostbusters is getting rebooted and coming out. And one of our ideas is to celebrate that by actually using collaborative play, two, three, four people in proton packs in front of Music Hall, blasting ghosts coming out of the windows in Washington Park. So working on that. Yeah. You're well underway of game development oh, yeah, with that, right? <laughs> So the idea here would be to use uh, some kind of pointing device. So I was considering Wiimotes. Um, there, is, there is a way, I haven't experimented entirely with it yet, to, to make a sensor bar that can, like, if you're familiar with the sensor bar on a Wii is about this long. Yeah, that's because it was designed for your living room. But if you make it wider, you can end up with people standing much further away. Each Wiimote is actually a camera inside looking for those dots. And as long as it can see them, it can uh, triangulate uh, where you're pointing. So if anybody has a line on a one block long Wiimote, uh, we will take yeah. that. <laughs> uh, no, that's all I got. If you're interested in more information, want to get a reach out, you have a game idea, you want to kind of uh, collaborate with us, you can go through playcency.org or even fighttheblight.org. Um, but yeah, questions abound, I'm sure. Yes? Uh, it's sort of up in the air because we had such a tight timeline last uh, last year with the with the with the grant that we just sort of hurried up and did as many as we could. Again, we did six official last summer, starting uh, about a week after the All Star Game. Right, we tried to get it out for the All Star Game because there was going to be so many people in town, but we started a little after that. So we got the almost one every weekend, and I guess for July and August. Um, the goal, I mean, it'd be nice to do one a weekend when it's warm. Um, we can do indoor as well if we have enough space to run around, so it's not out of the question. Uh, but we use the winter months to calm down a bit, regroup, uh, figure out new design ideas. And uh, yeah, so about four months outdoor would be ideal, and then eight months of development. Yeah? So you talked about your grant. How, how do you get your funding, and what's the long term kind of approach to that? And then do you have any plans to try and scale it down in terms of size so that there's <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good one. Uh, our prototype box is pretty tiny, actually. Um, and we were using a home projector inside of a church up in Walnut Hills. So we could, in theory, do this for the home um, to make a smaller console that you, know, you could plug in in your driveway or whatever and project it on your garage, for sure. Um, as far as uh, the grant went, um, I mean, it was a little bit of luck. People's Liberty just kind of came out of nowhere and said that you know these are the $10,000 grants, and we chatted one day, like, can we do this for 10 grand? And it, it really did come down to whether or not we can get the projector to make a 40-foot you know, projection surface. Um, long term, we're still doing the grant process because we don't want to charge for this. The thing about video mapping, it's, it's a, sort of a new medium. It's an expensive medium. Um, you can't really rent. It's hard for an artist to rent those projectors and get them out there and power them and all that. So we want to make it accessible to people that like to play with video and animation and things of that nature. Um, so we don't want to charge them. However, 
if South by Southwest or Coachella approaches us and wants to like put it at their event, I'm like, okay, you have a lot of money, I'm going to charge you. So the idea would be to take revenue from those streams and pump it back into sort of more community in line events. Yeah. What's been Uh, no one has told us to stop yet. That's sort of the big thing with Play Cincy too. It's um, street art, as you know, it's, you, you don't ask for permission with that, you ask for forgiveness. Uh, that's the thing we go by. Uh, we tend to keep it in safe zones. We don't want to flood an area where we know there's going to be some security risk or you know the landlord is kind of a jerk or whatever. So, And we, we've had police drive by and be like, hey, what's up guys, it looks cool, okay, bye. Um, Typically, if you look like you belong there and you act like you belong there, no one's going to interfere with you. Um, and it's faster and cheaper for us to do that because to get permitting for things like this, it just, it's just out of our budget. So we'd rather pay the fine if there was one. Not yet. <laughs> Anybody else? Fire away. Yes? Yeah. We've actually, proud to say, we've been into all of our six sites, I believe, say all six were different neighborhoods so far. So we're not keeping it to downtown and OTR and all that. Um, we have to travel there first now, because when we start to go into the outer reach neighborhoods, it's harder to find a playing surface. Um, and that, that's been difficult, but we have things we're working on this summer, especially uh, to go to some of the more suburb places that are trying to get you know, their, their voice heard amongst all these neighborhoods that are scrounging for money to be like, help us out with development. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, we just got it out first. And we actually probably will be taking it on the road this summer too. We've been asked to come to Columbus uh, and Lexington. So as long as it's pretty close and it's not gonna like drain our budget too much, we can, we can take it out there too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's been this project because it's getting the most play, if you will. Um, we do have other th ideas. I mean, once you fire this thing up six, seven, eight times and you lift this box out of the van eight more times, like you want to move on <laughs> and go to something else and train somebody else how to use this thing. Um, we do have other ideas sort of in the queue, but we just haven't been able to get to them right now. Um, a big thing is uh, we're hoping for a big grant to kind of finish coming through so that we can get a workspace because we've been doing most of this out of um, our homes or other people's homes and obviously you saw how big this is it's we need an area with a loading dock and to get it into the van so um, if this grant comes through we should be able to finally like live somewhere and be able to work on it at least part-time two days a week and then move on to something else yeah Uh, well, it was me and Tyler for most of it, um, for development and all that stuff. And then when we go to events, we just try to wrangle as many friends as possible. So we could have two or three other extra hands to help us lift things in and out of the van. Um, Pam, right here, she's sort of become our uh, events coordinator of sorts. She's great at wrangling in the herd as it is. So when we get 20 or 30 people lined up, um, she you know, gets everybody in line, tells who to get ready next, because you do have to like suit up a little bit, and we want to make sure, and gameplay is surprisingly fast. Everyone's like, ah, oh, Space Invaders, I got this, and then they're dead in like three seconds, because they don't move. <laughs> this is like the move for everybody, like, all right. Ah. And then, <laughs> ah. Okay. I noticed a lot of people try to lean too. Oh yeah, the leaning thing is great. They try like, to like, yeah, think they can like, but they're, they're playing no, on a spaceship, no. they can't lean, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's more like this, guys. Come on, you gotta do this. Right, yeah. um, but it takes people like two or three times to figure that out, which is great. So they'll just get out of line, go back in line, and do it again. But, yeah. Um, we tried to break that down because right now we're dealing with gasoline for the generator and lamp hours. Um, lamp hours, the lamps are expensive. They are again around $2,000 for a new lamp. They last about 1,000 hours. So um, I just did the math in my head. What is that, 20 bucks an hour basically for one of those things to fire up? So in theory, it's about $50 for per event. Um, but the other trick is I work weekends and he doesn't, so now we're trying to like manage those schedules of like who can manage it on the weekend, who can manage it during the week, and what does it cost, you know, for us to be there, kind of thing. So when an event like a Coachella or South by or Luminosity comes at us, being like, hey, can you just fire this up for us? We have to come up with a number to be like, 
yes, this will, <laughs> this will make us want to go pick it out of the warehouse and load it into our van and bring it to your neighborhood kind of thing. But it's, it's really not that expensive if a community organization wanted to fire it up or if a local artist wanted to borrow it or something like that. Yeah? Do you, do you find that uh, people who've been at the different events are the people who knew about it, social media or otherwise, or are they just walking by and like, oh, this, this is Yeah, no, that's a good one. Uh, the first couple were really well marketed, um, and that was people that were just like, hey, it's Friday, and I saw you on my Facebook feed. I'm going to stop by. And yeah, that was awesome, and it built from that. And what's great is like once you get two or three people jumping in the street, all of a sudden you have to turn around, and there's 30. Um, a lot of the later ones we didn't publicize kind of on purpose just to test it out. And actually, our most unsuccessful one that I refuse to talk about, <laughs> but I will now just for the hell of it. Um, my little sister was in town, uh, she's from New Jersey, and I was like, ah, I'll take her to a Bengals tailgate. And it was, um, was it Bengals Steelers? I don't know. It was, a, it was a big one. And we tried to get in Longworth Hall at first, and we weren't actually in the hall. But if anyone's been to a Bengals tailgate, I mean, there's thousands of people standing around. We, were, we had a really prime <laughs> building, and we were like, hey, mind if we fire this up? Nah, it's cool, yeah, oh, it plays music? Can I play my iPod? <laughs> like, no, but look, you can play Space Invaders. Ah, uh -huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like literally it was just me and Pam and like one other person played this thing amongst a sea of thousands of people and I was so depressed. They didn't, they didn't want to ruin their reputations by losing at this game in front of a bunch of football fans. That was the theory. That was, that was the growing theory. Um, but no, the, the pass by is, it's, it's, it works really well. So again, we're not as dense as other cities, so it's where you park it. Uh, when we were out there during uh, Midpoint, we were parked pretty close to stages, so people passing by the stages uh, would come and play it. A lot of out-of-town bands were like, dude, this is amazing. Like, can you bring this to my next event? I'm like, yeah, sure, give me your name. Um, and it, it, you know, it's, a, it's an eye-catcher. It's a shiny object. It's huge. It's not tiny. It's three times the size of this, so yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, yeah, it's super creepy when I started growing a mustache and driving around a creepy van uh, with no windows. Um, it, it's going to look cool eventually. We would like to get some local artists to kind of tag it up and make it look fun. But yeah. Yeah. Yes, I would. If anybody, you have free reign to have fun with my van if you'd like. Wait a minute. No wizards. No wizards on the van. <laughs> no wizards. No wizards. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it, yes? So, um, thinking of your events, you said you're not charging for this? Right. right. Okay. Uh, and do, you, do you have any other like, additional marketing that goes into it? Like, do you have local food trucks that show up to all the food and anything like that? Or people saying where you'll be here? Yeah, uh, good question. So, the plan is eventually to grow it up to be a a big grown-up event like that. Um, we were testing it last summer uh, at the events, basically just to see how people reacted to it, to make sure the equipment would hold up to being beaten up as much as it was, lots of people wearing it, getting rugged with it, um, seeing if we could make ourselves more efficient, if we could make the box lighter and all that stuff. Uh, we did most of that through Facebook posts. Uh, we do have a plan for actual posters to be putting up in places. Um, it was a very sort of on the cusp event too because like we wanted to be kind of uh, spontaneous about it not pop up but like when you're not asking for permission to be in a public space you don't really want to you know say hey we're going to be here like weeks in advance and then the cops are there waiting for you etc cetera, etc cetera. so um but we do when we do want to work with events and people like that we are going to publicize it more we do have a plan for food carts to get involved uh, food trucks to be around to make it bigger uh, we were having some sound issues last summer so we want to try and fix those things and you know have more of an mc type event to it create leaderboards so that people can see um, you know, who is still on top. Um, and another thing is to bring in the site knowledge itself. So uh, we did this through the Facebook page, talking about where we were going to be and why we were going to be there. Like, this is an abandoned lot. It's been abandoned because of this. And the, the owner let it fall into decay, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we would like to bring more of that back in, the history of the, of the lot, um, to make it more of a fun event that way. But, yeah. One back there, anyway. Uh, we've tested a couple different ones. It works best at about three to four stories. Um, the one that, it was okay. I didn't really like it that much. We tested on the Clifton Market Space, the old IGA market up uh, in Northside. It was, it was fine. It worked. But it just didn't look as cool as the bigger ones. 
I uh, wanted to actually put it uh, on Paul Brown Stadium at one point, <laughs> just to see if that would work. But we'll get there. Yeah. So one thing I noticed is at the events is uh, it's actually a lot of work. You know, it's kind of like a workout. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's like a workout pattern that you could kind of put out there. Could be. Yeah, that could be cool. If we theme the game around it more, perhaps something like that. Might not even have to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that was something we noticed pretty quick when we were testing it is how tired we were getting. Um, we could only test it a couple times and we were like, all right, it works, move on, <laughs> debug it this way and we'll try it again next week. Um, it's a, it is a great workout and depending on your strategy, again, you could be a sprinter. I'm a sprinter. I like sprinting. I thought that's how I got the highest scores. But Brendan, the guy with the highest score, he was, he was a sniper. Yeah. He was kind of strategic. He would just be like, I'm like, all right, you're boring, but you're there forever <laughs> playing, so I can't argue. Uh, yeah. I was really hoping uh, some old grizzled Space Invader veteran might show up who like knows all the ins and outs of the game, but I'm still <laughs> waiting for that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Has Taito ever tried to contact you about using the game? <laughs> not no, yet. They, uh, I don't think so. No, no, not so far. Not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we've gotten a good amount of publicity with it as far as, um, where were we? We were in Wired, Wired Online yeah. did an article about us, and I don't think it's gotten to the home mothership just yet, but I mean, we're not charging for it, so how mad could they be? Yeah, the worst thing could happen would be like, stop it. Like yeah, you're like, okay. like, no, okay, what if we just take the invaders and make them blue, ha ha. <laughs> Well, the Wii Bar hasn't been, uh, like, I haven't tried it out yet, but uh, there's communities of strange people on the internet. <laughs> uh, the whole idea with the camera tracking a vest actually came from a community of people. Uh, how many people remember the original Microsoft Surface table? It was uh, also known as the big ass table, about as big as this giant screen. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole community of people who have, the, like, they build their own by putting a camera down there and, like, watching the surface, and uh, it sort of observes your fingers. Uh, either emitting IR light with the reflective surface or breaking it, I can't remember which one. But the point is uh, uh, there's these communities of people who have like, figured out a lot of this stuff and we're just sort of like moving it and changing it around. And in the case of the Wii Bar, there's just some people who had like you know ridiculously big uh, basement home movie theaters and they were like, I want to play my Wii there. So there, somebody came out with a spreadsheet and a formula like, this, if, like how far back do you want to be? This is how far away the infrared lights need to be. And nobody's tried one, as far as I know, to make it try to work is on something as big as a building. But in theory, it should work. <laughs> so I have to try it out sometime. <laughs> so in here, I thought it was just we got lucky. Hmm? Well, with the PSI, oh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't that, think it would work. Yeah, that was to lucky, be too, because that camera is super cheap. And it wasn't super amazingly popular. So there's a lot of them out there. Like even today, you can go to Amazon and buy a, a brand new one that's for like $6. The, you just have to modify it yourself, which involves digging out a lens, which takes a long time. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, originally we had two eyes, and that was seeing too much, actually. We were surprised yeah. at the range. I remember at first we crazy. were worried that we would need to to get the full range, but once we found out how far back everything needed to be, it can see everything. So, yeah. It's creepy. <laughs> anyway. Yes? Uh, I'm a programmer at a design firm downtown called Kaleidoscope. Yeah. I used to be a creative director there, but I decided to just go into bartending. Oh, yeah. So I do that Thursday through Sunday. And then the other days, I do stuff like this. He, like, he makes delicious milkshakes at uh, Bar and Sundry. What? Sundry and Vice. Sundry and Vice. Bar. Yeah, yeah. It's a bar. It's a bar. <laughs> yeah. He makes great waffles. <laughs> I was supposed to make some today, but I, I didn't. Oh, thanks. It's a chili cook-off today. Uh, <laughs> anyway. All right. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody? Bueller? Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much.